Scientists say they are not to be confused with little green men, but the small fossil remains of microbes discovered on a Mars meteorite and the water discovered on a Jupiter moon may reshape our ideas of the universe. What are the scientific, philosophic, and religious repercussions of this supposed discovery of extraterrestrial life? Tonight, a consideration of our changing understanding of the universe and humankind's place in it. Joining me here in New York, Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson, an astrophysicist from Princeton University and the director of the Hayden Planetarium here in New York. Also here, Lionel Tiger, professor of anthropology at Rutgers University. And from Washington, Dr. Richard Berenson, professor of physics at American University. Uh, I first, Dr. Uh, Richard Berenson, I come first to you. Uh, tell me this story uh, and the significance of it and, and what was discovered in case somebody has, has been on Mars and not reading <laughs> about this. Well, it's utterly stunning if it is true, and I've got to emphasize the if part, if it is true, it could arguably be the great find of the 20th century, maybe of all humankind. What was found was a meteorite in Antarctica, sitting there in the ice flow, and scooped up, put in a box, it didn't look dissimilar from other meteorites. This one is about the size of a large potato, weighs around four and a half pounds, and most meteorites have come from the asteroid belt. They're from out past Mars, between Mars and Jupiter. The difference was that when chemically analyzed, this one didn't look like the Earth, nor did it look like a typical meteorite. In fact, it looked very strange indeed. Now, about a dozen of these strange kind of things have been found. It turns out that their chemistry and also trapped air inside of them doesn't match the Earth or a meteorite. It matches, however, exactly what the Viking craft of the United States found when they soft landed on Mars in 1976. In short, they are chunks of Mars dislodged from Mars millions of years ago because some large object impacted on that planet. Mars has low gravity, and so those chunks simply floated away. And there they were, out in this frozen, dark, silent blackness of interplanetary space for millions of years until one fateful day, the Earth and its path around the sun collided and they passed through the atmosphere, wham down into Antarctica, went beneath the ice, froze, and then after a time, gurgled back to the surface. Well, that's interesting itself, but better. Upon carefully examining that precious dozen, one of them turned out to be the oldest, about 4.5 billion years old. That means it's just about as old as Mars itself, or the Earth itself, or the entire solar system. Interesting. On further examination, they found in it signs of hydrocarbons. Now that's interesting too, because that is a first for Mars. But on even more examination, the team doing it after two years of trying to test and see did we find it or didn't we find it, concluded that they think they found the fossilized remains of a primitive Martian biota, now long extinct. But the fact it could have been there at all 3.6 billion years ago when life was arising right here on Earth utterly is stunning. Thank you. That was a very good <laughs> recap. Of it. Now, my question to you is, what do you believe? I believe that uh, if it were presented to a jury of 12 scientists, we'd have a hung jury. A hung jury. I think we'd have a hung jury because um, some would say I believe it, some would say I don't, and most would say I want to know more. And you would say? I want to know more. I'd like to have other teams examine it, which is happening. I'd like, ideally, to have a sample return send a robotic mission to Mars, go traveling around, dig up parts, and bring them back, and then test them here in a pristine lab. That's what NASA would like, too, right? They would, and uh, there has been a plan like that on the drawing board for years. It may, however, get advanced up to maybe 2003. You can only launch during certain launch windows. They come 25 months apart, and a good time, maybe the first time, would be the year 2003. Dr. Tyson, what would you add to this in terms of, of your own perspective? Well, that was quite a substantial review of the, quite <laughs> the good, progress quite good there. Too. I knew what I was getting. When we asked Barrison to come on. <laughs> um, I'd like to add or counter comment that I think a jury of twelve scientists. Uh, I, I think to claim that you'd have a hung jury is a little a little severe. I think all twelve scientists would agree that the evidence is compelling. Mm -hmm. And scientists, yes, some will believe one thing or believe another, but when they all look at the evidence. And as the evidence as it was laid out in the original research paper, that evidence taken together provides compelling evidence for the possibility of an extinct biota 
on Mars. Now, those who are a little more skeptical, as, as uh, Richard had noted, would, would appeal to yet further missions to go to Mars. Other might say, others might say, well, maybe further missions aren't necessary, but I'm convinced they would all uh, agree that it was compelling. And if, in fact, you're on that jury and you say, I believe you share what Richard Barrington said about the significance of this, the fact that there was some kind of primitive life on Mars is one extraordinary discovery. Extraordinary. I would rank it up there among the greatest scientific discoveries in the history of science. Up there even with the discovery of the expanding universe or the notion that the system of planets orbits the sun rather than Earth. So I, I would rank it up there. Lionel Tiger, why are we so fascinated by this? I mean, I cannot get enough. Well, for one thing, we all have a suspicion. This is my Simpson trial. It's not, it's, uh, it's not, it's not just your problem. Uh, you know, we're all uh, deeply conscious, whether we are prepared to admit it or not, of mortality. And we have a whole series of get-out clauses, such as heaven and hell and biblical book, biblical announcements and various other things, which suggest that we, we're not going to snuff it. But in fact, the evidence is fairly strong, and it wouldn't be a hung jury on that one, I think. Uh, so we're, we're deeply concerned with... Um, why we're here, what it's about, what's our job, what's our option, what's our advantage, what's our disadvantage, and to suddenly get from outer space, literally, an entire notion of a struggling universe potentially uh, involved with some of the same traffic problems and, uh, and broken cable television systems and the like that we have is, is, is kind of stunningly reassuring because it suggests that, that the, the, uh, the arbitrariness of life itself has a larger purpose, which is that it's not just our problem, it's generalized. Richard Burnson, back to you. The notion of life on a, at another place, that we are not alone, is Mars the best place that there's likely to be other forms of life? No, as a matter of fact, I didn't think in my lifetime I'd ever find even any kind of trace of extinct life in our own solar system. We thought Mars, of course, for centuries, but then the Viking craft landed there and their results were rather discouraging. Suggesting, Mars, that the, suggesting if I could interrupt, that the conditions for life surviving, the absence of water, whatever, was simply not there. Well, yeah, and they found no signs of a biology, past or present. That doesn't mean it's not there, and they couldn't move around, and maybe they weren't looking the right way. They didn't preclude it, they just didn't find it. But what they did take with their orbiters were some stunning photographs where you could see there had been vast floods. Where did all that water go? We think it's now frozen down in a permanent layer, a permafrost, under the surface of Mars. Aside from that, there is a moon of Jupiter, and data have just come back from there, which are, I think, pretty provocative. Now, you would think it's so far away, all the way out of Jupiter, it's just too cold out there. But this moon, Europa, ironically named for an old civilization, might be the harbinger of new life. Why? Because under a layer of ice, this icy billiard ball, we think there is liquid water. Where does the heating come from? Well, from tidal forces from the nearby moons. And the new pictures from the Galileo spacecraft seem to confirm that it is probably warm. But, but isn't, isn't it possible that, that what we're doing is imposing our notion of what life is? If we were able to interview a rock, we might find that its point of view on the universe was substantially different from ours and that there, there is, in fact, a mechanism of existence that, that you just described with underwater uh, hot water and whatnot running around that, that, that has its own authenticity. And somehow uh, we're astonished to find that, uh, that yeah, yes, we're not alone, but that um, we keep trying to impose like uh, an ugly American abroad in the 1950s Graham Greedon sense, our own ethic on the rest of the planets. The rocks might be very, very content and interested in their own existence. Um, what's next in this sort of inquiry, Richard Berenson? Where do we go? Well, the rock that was found in um, Antarctica is now being examined by other teams, and uh, scientists love to argue with each other, and they will be writing papers and arguing for some time. Uh, also, there will be three missions going to Mars this fall. They were planned many years ago, two American and a Russian. One of the American will have a little robotic rover. It's the first time we'll ever have a device that will roam around on the surface of another planet named Sojourner. And it's about 22 pounds. It's about the size of your microwave. It's unfortunate, however, that it was not programmed in advance far enough to know about this discovery so that it could make the kinds of uh, searches that we would ideally want. The Russian mission will actually dig down inside of Mars. And now the big debate is what should come after that. 
And as you know, uh, President Clinton has called for a big summit on all this coming in November, which is to be bipartisan and debated at some length. Incidentally, President Bush some years ago called for the United States to return to the moon and go on to Mars with a human settlement and to do so with a date certain by July 20th of the year 2019, the 50th anniversary of the Apollo landing. Suppose we made an all-out commitment in the same way that we made the 10-year, the President Kennedy made his commitment to put a man on the moon. How long would it take? Well, we happen to have the technology to do it, especially if we have a partnership with Russia, which has by far the longest experience with uh, long-term microgravity, uh, much more than we do. If we have a partnership with uh, the European Space Agency, the Canadians, which are terrific about building robotic arms, the Japanese with their microelectronics, it could be done by um, 2012, 2015. The problem is, first of all, the huge cost. Will the nation back it? Will the world back it? But the second problem is you want to ensure the safety of your astronauts. That is a tough trip. Can you imagine your five closest friends and you being confined to a room the size of your living room at best for three years? Uh, in addition to all the physical problems, you've got a few others to deal yeah. with, too. All right. Thank you all. I'm unfortunately out of time. Life on Mars, our subject. There is a picture from Time magazine. Uh, and here is a story from Newsweek with a with a similar picture. Uh, it got a lot of attention and continues to get a lot of attention. I thank you all, each and all for joining me. Coming up later, uh, we'll talk to Francis Ford Coppola, his career in film. Stay with us.